Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We'll now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at their present levels, at least through the summer of 2019, and in any case, for as long as necessary to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below, but close to 2% over the medium term. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we will continue to make net purchases under the asset purchase program at the new monthly pace of 15 billion euros until the end of December 2018. We anticipate that subject to incoming data confirming our medium term inflation outlook, we will then end net purchases. We intend to reinvest the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time after the end of our net asset purchases, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. Incoming information while somewhat weaker than expected, remains overall consistent with an ongoing broad-based expansion of the euro area economy and gradually rising inflation pressures. The underlying strength of the economy continues to support our confidence that the sustained convergence of inflation to our aim will proceed and will be maintained even after a gradual winding down of our net asset purchases. At the same time, uncertainties relating to protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility remain prominent. Significant monetary policy stimulus is still needed to support the further buildup of domestic price pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. This support will continue to be provided by the net asset purchases until the end of the year, by the sizable stock of acquired assets and the associated reinvestments, and by our enhanced forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates. In any event, the Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the Governing Council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.4% quarter on quarter in both the first and the second quarter of 2018. Incoming information, while somewhat weaker than expected, remains overall consistent with our baseline scenario of an ongoing broad-based economic expansion supported by domestic demand and continued improvements in the labor market. Some recent sector-specific developments are having an impact on the near-term growth profile. Our monetary policy measures continue to underpin domestic demand. Private consumption is fostered by ongoing employment growth and rising wages. At the same time, business investment is supported by solid domestic demand, favorable financing conditions, and corporate profitability. Housing investment remains robust. In addition, the expansion in global activity is expected to continue 
supporting euro area exports, though at a slower pace. The risks surrounding euro area growth outlook can still be assessed as broadly balanced. At the same time, risks relating to protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility remain prominent. Euro area annual HICP inflation increased to 2.1% in September 2018 from 2% in August, reflecting mainly higher energy and food price inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, annual rates of headline inflation are likely to hover around the current level over the coming months. While measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, they have been increasing from earlier lows. Domestic cost pressures are strengthening and broadening amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to pick up towards the end of the year and to increase further over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 growth stood at 3.5% in September 2018 after 34 in August. Apart from some volatility monthly flows, M M3 growth is increasingly supported by bank credit creation. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The growth of loans to the private sector strengthened further, continuing the upward trend observed since the beginning of 2014. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations rose to 4.3% in September from 4.1% in August, while the annual growth rate of loans to households stood at 3.1% unchanged from the previous month. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the third quarter of 2018 indicates that loan growth continues to be supported by increasing demand across all loan categories and favorable bank lending conditions for loans to enterprises and loans for house purchase. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the broad-based expansion calls for rebuilding fiscal buffers. This is particularly important in countries where government debt is high and for which full adherence to the Stability and Growth Pact is critical for safeguarding sound fiscal positions. Likewise, 
the transparent and consistent implementation of the EU fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of the economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council urges specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the capital markets union. And we are now at your disposal for questions. Mr. Kowani. Mr. President, did you discuss downgrading your risk assessment to tilt it to the downside? And if, uh, what were the main arguments for and against the second question? In the past, you said, you know, look at the facts and the words. The facts have been coming in, and they haven't been that There's a budget in which of EU rules. It's been rejected by the Commission. Now it's facts on the table. What is your assessment now? rejeté par la Commission, comment évaluez-vous les faits I mean, will a little, Alors, little time. Euh, il faudra un uh, peu de temps pour répondre à votre première question. Large, Mais d'une façon générale, les discussions du Conseil and, uh, de a confirmé l'équilibre des risques policy. et nous n'avons pris aucune so décision the, en matière de politique monétaire. Alors, nous avons acquis qu'il y a une dynamique Eurozone countries, which still have positive output gaps and slightly expansionary, and sometimes, in some cases, pro-cyclical fiscal policies in some countries. So we're talking about a weaker momentum, not a downturn. And this is clearly certified by uh, surveying, most surveying uh, indicators that come faiblesse. out since the last Et time we met. But these indicators remain above, and in some cases well above, historical average. And certainly it's certified by slower growth. Une, uh, so then the issue is what are the reasons behind this weaker momentum and these weaker uh, survey indicators? And here we go into a variety of explanations, one of which certainly is country-specific factors, uh, so-called idiosyncratic phenomena. Think about the car sector in Germany. This is, a, is having quite a powerful effect for this quarter, but not next quarter. So the, the other quest, next question is, well, first let me go through the various things. The second is the export performance. Last, last time we discussed the export performance saying that last year, 2017, had an extraordinary export performance. Now we're coming back to normal. And so we had a decline in exports that seems now is reflected in the current weaker momentum, but seems now come to a halt. Then of course we have trade uncertainties. We have the stalemate between US and China with Brexit, with Italy, with financial markets, volatility, so a bunch of uncertainties. And then we have the, perhaps the one and impart, important part of explanation, it's simply that we're having growth returning to potential after 2017 where it was clearly about potential. So it's not simple here to distinguish what is transitory from what is gonna be permanent, what is country specific, to what is, uh, from what is uh, extended to the whole of the Euro area, and what is actually having an impact on consumption and investment, and what is not having an impact. We, for one thing, we still observe consumption pretty strong, buoyed by an expanding employment, an expanding labor market, rising wages, and so business investment. So also the emerging market economy situation seems to have stabilized somehow. So all in all, uh, the assessment of the, uh, of the governing council was, yes, there is a weaker momentum. Yes, there are weaker uh, survey data coming out and maybe some more are expected in the future, but is this enough to, is this enough of a change to make us change the baseline scenario? The answer is no. The, the, the balance of these risks uh, are not, have not been considered at this point in time enough to uh, change the balance of risk. Now, of course, we'll have to see the projections in December. 
and that was also one other consideration. Um, I will elaborate on inflation and monetary policy later. Uh, on, on, on Italy, it was, you have to remember that Italy is a fiscal discussion. So there wasn't much discussion about Italy. As a matter of fact, the, um, the uh, Vice President Dombrovsky was there and, uh, and basically I asked him permission to quote him, to quote what he said. He said, of course we have to, uh, we have to observe and apply fiscal rules, but we're also seeking a dialogue. I think that's what, uh, that's what it is, but then I can answer other questions about the facts. Thank you. Mr. Conti. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, still, again, in, mm, about Italy. Um, I, was, I would like to refer to your recent statements that the Italian situation Thank was you. not posing any risks of contagion. So my question is whether you confirm this statement or whether it has changed? No, I didn't and say it was any risk of contagion. I said at that point in time, there was no sign of contagion. Oh, okay. It's different. Yes. Um, okay, let me also respond to the other part of the question was asked uh, before about the, uh, what, what, are, what are the facts? First, let me say, what's the context? The context of our discussion today was, as I said before, the statement by the Vice President of the Commission who said of course, he has to apply fiscal rules, but he's also seeking a dialogue. The second point of context is what I said in the previous press conference in the IMF during the course of the IMF meetings, is that I personally, but that's a personal perception, so I take it for what's worth, I'm confident that uh, an agreement will be found. Now, let me come to the facts. Interest rates have come up and uh, are coming up. And so that means the lending rates are going up, still moderately, I should say, for households and for firms. And uh, so it means that households will have to pay more for borrowing from banks, and so do companies. Of course, companies, in the case of companies that finance fund themselves issuing bonds, the pass through from the capital markets to the bond market, to the corporate bond market, is obviously faster. So for them, the increase in borrowing rates is being more marked and more and quicker. Uh, now, all this likely means that uh, will have effects on credit and ultimately on growth. And by the way, on the very same space that it's needed for fiscal expansion. So in a sense, after the interest rates, if the interest rates keep on going up, the room that it's available to expand the budget gets smaller. Uh, on, the, on the facts on concerning, uh, the, the, there is, uh, as I said, the increases in interest rates have been there now for a while. We've analyzed in both through surveys and through direct evidence, these increasing rates, but these increasing rates are not so far, at least banking rates, are not significant or not material. However, we have now the bank lending survey of this quarter, and uh, it does say that um, uh, basically terms and conditions applied by Italian banks on new loans to enterprises and households for house purchases tightened. Terms and conditions, so no standards, terms and conditions tightened in the third quarter of 2018, driven by higher cost of funds and balance sheet constraints. Now, what about the spillovers? Since the last time I spoke about, I commented about this, we have observed some increase in interest rates in some other countries of non-core countries, let's call them this way. It's again, it's not, mm, it's not material, but it's been there. And so again, the issue is what's the cause of them? Because these countries themselves had specific idiosyncratic phenomena, facts, events that may justify and have been estimated to justify some increase in rates. 
So, so far we reached, I think, the, the conclusion that uh, it's, it's kind of hard to distinguish. There may be some spillovers, but they are limited. That's the current assessment, and I will, uh, I will, keep, you, I will keep you posted as the situation will evolve. Ms. Nook? Carolyn Nook, Bloomberg. Um, Mr. Draghi, another question on the situation in Italy. Um, there have been some concerns that weaker Italian banks could become capital impaired if the spread with German bunds reaches 400 basis points. Do you think that this could uh, compromise the monetary transmission mechanism? And if so, um, what tools do you see available for repairing that? And uh, my second question is on inflation. Um, what is justifying your confidence on inflation pressures uh, given that core inflation rates have actually disappointed several times this year and as you said uh, there, there are certain geopolitical risks that seem to be increasing um, at what point do you worry that the wage and inflation pressures that we see are going to be short-lived yeah let me uh, answer first the second question uh, the uh, discussion the governing council showed that there isn't much of a change in inflation really but when we look at uh, surrounding developments we see that um, negotiated wages keep on going up. This is a very comforting sign because it means that wage increases, which by the way in some core countries have been quite uh, significant, wage increases uh, are gonna stay. They are not uh, temporary, they are not drift determined, but they are negotiated wages, so they're gonna stay and they've been uh, Second, they've been uh, quite, in some countries, significant, but in general, the nominal wage growth is picking up. The other thing is the labor market is, keeps on expanding, but it's, cons it's, it's progressively, gradually tighter and tighter. And the third thing is that capacity utilization rates in, uh, in most countries are pretty high. So, we, frankly, after all this assessment, we have no sense that we should doubt about our confidence that inflation is gradually converging to our aim. But having said that, we reaffirm the fact that our monetary policy needs to remain accommodative and, uh, and a considerable degree of monetary accommodation is still needed. I. I see that there are lots of concerns, well, not lots, some concerns about APP maybe ending at the end of this year. Let me tell you one thing that I've said on and on and on. Even if it were to end, monetary policy will remain very accommodative by the reinvestment, especially the reinvestment of the considerable stock of assets that we have in our, in our balance sheet and our forward guidance about interest rates. And let me read this about the introductory statement, this sentence. It says, this support will continue to be provided by the net asset purchases until the end of the year by the sizable stock of acquired assets and the associated reinvestments and by our enhanced forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates. In any event, the governing council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the governing council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. So that's, that's what I can say about inflation. Um, on Italy, I, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have an idea whether it's 300 or 400, whatever. Uh, so it's, it's difficult, but certainly uh, these bonds are in the bank's portfolios. If they lose value, they are denting into the capital position of the banks. That's obvious. So that's, that's, what, that's what it is. So you have a, a, a one may have, but I, as I said, I, I still, I, I'm still, I shouldn't say optimistic, but I'm still confident that an agreement will be found uh, that, uh, that basically, yes, you have a denting capital position. Then, of course, you have a weakening funding conditions as well. And, and all this is going to translate into different lending terms. Mr. Fellis. Thank you. Uh, Tom Fellis, North Street Journal. Mr. Draghi, 
Um, you mentioned that you thought there would be a deal between Italy and the EU. Do you sympathize at all with what um, Italy's argument is, that it needs more budget flexibility, uh, given also that its budget deficit is still planned to be below 3%, even if that, that isn't how the Commission sees it? Do you sympathize with, the, with their argument? Uh, the second question is on um, the rise in market interest rates in Italy and um, Spain and Portugal. How much of that do you think can be traced to the end of QE in December? And what would it take for the ECB to extend, what would the ECB need to, st need to see to extend QE into next year? Thank you. Now, first, last. Uh, we haven't talked about any extension. As, as you've seen, language is exactly the same as before. And as I said a moment ago, we, you have to consider that monetary policy will remain very accommodative, even in case we were to end, to decide to end QE at the end of the year. Um, now, will the end of QE um, put pressure on spreads? You know, by and large, but let me say first one thing, let me repeat one thing. Over the, over the past few months, we have not bought Greek bonds, but we have bought Italian bonds. And still, in spite of that, we saw that the spreads between Greece and Italy narrow down. So, the, in the case of, of a suspension of QE, you would expect that spreads are going to be affected depending only on the net issuance of different countries. Okay? That's the answer. So by itself, if countries were not, or if countries in the hypothesis that they were having the same degree of issuance, the same net issuance, you wouldn't see any change in spreads. So it's not, the end of QE is not a selective measure addressed to any specific country is a measure, of, it's a monetary policy measure that it's uh, justified by our confidence in the convergence of inflation to our aim. Now the first question is whether I have sympathy for this or that. I mean, I just, um, I don't know what to respond with that. And we have the commission, the commission is the ultimate guardian of the stability and growth pact, not the ECB. Continue, Wes. I have a question about the Spain. The Spanish ha High Court has decided that the banks have to pay the stamp duty of a mortgage and not the customers. What do you think about it? Do you expect an impact in the prof uh, profitability of the Spanish banks? I will uh, completely defer the answer to the Vice President of the ECB. Well, we do not comment on that any, any sort of ruling from the courts, we respect uh, you know, the rulings from the uh, Supreme Court of Spain. Ms. Jones? Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, would it be possible to get some sense of what exactly the options are for the governing council should the news flow remain as poor as it has? Over the past, Sorry, should, should the, the news flow, should the, the data continue to be bad? Should the market turmoil continue? Should relations between Rome and Brussels worsen? Um, and you are forced to downgrade your assessment for the outlook. It seems as though there's a very high bar to continuing to expand QE past the end of this year. So are you starting to talk about what you could do with reinvestments or what you could say on the path of interest rates? And for my second question, um, both, both the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve seems to be coming under a lot of political pressure to keep all of your monetary stimulus in place or provide more stimulus even. So you know, what would you say to the lawmakers that are really mounting on both sides of the Atlantic quite a, a fierce challenge to your operational independence? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the answer to the first question is really um, first of all, we haven't discussed what we're going to do next. So we are, as I told you last time, we had two meetings before the end of the year, and uh, we didn't discuss anything in this meeting, so we're going to discuss in, in the next meeting, where we'll also have the projections, which will also cast some more light on uh, what's going to happen next. Uh, the, uh, we've 
we, we, do, we do think that we still have tools in our toolbox that we can use different contingencies. We have not discussed any one of them today. Uh, the Teltro was raised by two speakers only, but not in any detail. But this is just an example of how the toolbox is still quite, uh, quite uh, rich in terms of monetary policy instruments. The, um, on the second question you had, um, what I would answer, I would answer the central bank independence is a precious thing. Uh, it's precious because it's uh, a essential for the credibility of the central banks and credibility is essential for effectiveness. So central bank independence in terms of uh, how to comply and deliver their mandates, which in our case is, uh, is price stability, and central bank independence in choosing the instruments that are more appropriate or most appropriate to pursue this objective is crucial for the effectiveness of monetary policy. And if one thinks about that, one would conclude that actually the legislators themselves, often the very same people who are arguing for the central banks to do this and that, should be the first ones to care about monetary policy effectiveness and uh, central banks uh, reaching their goals, pursuing their mandates. Thank you. Mr. Rasch? Michael Rasch, NZZ. Uh, two questions, if I may. If I'm right, uh, next year there will be a new calculation of the capital key with probably an increasing weight of Germany and a decreasing weight of Italy. Uh, what follows or technical follows does it have for the reinvestment program next year? And uh, the second question concerning Italy, uh, do you see a danger that the ECB will come uh, under a kind of uh, fiscal dominance uh, from Italy? Or is Italy still in the heads of the ECB Council in the meetings? Thank you. Now, uh, answering the second question first, we don't see such a risk. The, and, and this links with the, what, uh, with the previous question about central bank independence. Central bank independence is predicated on monetary dominance, not on fiscal dominance. And uh, to finance government deficits is not part of our mandate. Our mandate is price stability. So that is the, of course we have, as you will remember from the previous crisis, we have OMT as a specific instrument, but uh, uh, other than that, we have uh, we have um, we are in a regime of monetary dominance. The uh, first question is about capital key. We haven't we haven't discussed we haven't discussed that uh, in uh, in a minute. But just keep in mind, and you are right. There's a capital key readjustment beginning of the year. There's also another capital key adjustment uh, with Brexit. So that's also to be kept in mind. But uh, we haven't. Uh, basically discussed any of them. Thank you. Mr. Schwarz. Thank you, Mark Schwarz, Börsenzeitung. Um, the ECB is giving a lot of guidance, forward guidance on rates, on QE, on reinvestments. This is a little bit in contrast to, to previous times uh, and another pre-commit uh, era. Um, my question is how much guidance can and should the ECB give, especially in times of high uncertainty? Um, and the second question, um, you again mentioned progress in uh, strengthening the euro area. There is little progress on, on this front. How frustrated are you by that fact and uh, how worried are you that the discussion we have about Italy might even limit the willingness to, to move forward? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, guidance, uh, guidance for or guidance on interest rates, you remember it started in 2000. 13, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and then it evolved. Uh, it became guide. It became guidance on on asset purchases and our investments. So it has served us very well. It has kept uh, anchored the short term part of the yield curve while the QE was actually addressing the long term part of the yield curve and 
contrary to the, or let me put it this way, better than the experience in other jurisdictions, it, uh, it has uh, served us very, very, very well. I mean, you have look at the amount of volatility and, and there are all kinds of indicators showing that uh, it's been very successful. So all in all, credible guidance does reduce uncertainty. And then of course we have to, uh, we always discuss whether it should be state-based, state contingent or uh, data-based or both as it is in our case. But by and large, our, our experience has been, has been quite positive with guidance. Now, the second question is how frustrated, but it's not a matter of being frustrated. The, the fact is that our monetary union remains fragile if it's not completed. And uh, when I say completed, I mean the banking union, I mean the capital market union, I mean the fiscal capacity, the design of a fiscal capacity. And the, all these things, by the way, are intertwined because the better it is the capital market union, probably the less need we have for a big fiscal capacity. So, and this, to make progress on this, we, we need the right, I would say by and large, the right political contingency. It's not something that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, I mean, central bankers or bureaucrats can push forward by themselves. These are big changes. These are big changes in the, in, uh, very often in, in the way powers are being distributed between national parliaments and national executives and, and European authorities or even without an authority, European rules. So it's, uh, we have to be, at this point, m my sense is that we've got to be patient because we are not driving the political developments. We are part of them. Ms. Bufaki? Isabella Bufaki from Sole 24 Ore. I have two questions. Um, you didn't discuss the reinvestments, but I was wondering whether the Governing Council could at any stage consider the possibility to change the capital key as the guiding principle of the APP, given that the APP is one of its tools. Because just given to the new capital key, if, uh, if the GDP of a country grows, it has actually uh, more the, uh, APP, so kind of a more easing policy. And if the GDP of a country shrinks, actually it has, I wouldn't say tightening, but less easing. So that's um, something to think about. I don't know if you're going to. And uh, the other question is actually there again on the uh, Italian banks, just because the Italian, uh, Italian government um, is really outspoken about its worries about uh, the spread and Italian banks. But uh, could you say what are the tools? What can the ECB, but most of all, a government do in a world which is an BRRD world now? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, as far as the second question is concerned, namely, what can one do uh, as far as banks are concerned, uh, given the, the widening of the spreads that have taken place, that has taken place uh, in the last uh, five, six months? And um, I think there are, the first answers, maybe, I mean, there may be other answers, but the first answer that come to mind is, first of all, reduce the tone and, uh, and uh, don't question the constitutional existential framework of the euro. And the second is reduce the spreads. So uh, do policies that lead to a reduction in the spreads. Um, now on the, on the first point about the capital key, uh, no, we haven't discussed, I'd be surprised if we were to, uh, to use a different concept other than the capital key. We've used that for a long time now with the asset purchases, and so I'd be surprised, but as I said, we haven't discussed that. Uh, but you correctly say that there is a strange procyclicality here between the revision of the capital key and the economic situation of a country. True, but these adjustments, the capital key happen every five years. So it's not really, uh, in a sense, it, it just, a country happens to have a lower GDP because of a variety of reasons that may have nothing to do with cyclical stimulus. Ms. Weisbach? And 
Senator Vaspar, CNBC. I have a question on Brexit. Um, it seems that the whole world is preparing for a worst case scenario. So what is the ECB doing in terms of contingency planning? And if you haven't discussed any of these topics, we were asking you uh, whether you have discussed it. What have you discussed? Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, the, as you know, uh, this again, I think I've said a few times, we're not party to the negotiations. And uh, so everything will depend on what is the final outcome of the negotiations. And we certainly are monitoring and working together with the Bank of England to identify potential risks of a sudden, uh, hard, sudden uh, hard Brexit event. Uh, but let me repeat what I said, I think, in, uh, in the European, in European Council. It would really take an, an extraordinary amount of uh, lack of preparation to materialize the financial stability risks that might come from a hard Brexit. So by and large, I'm still confident that uh, a good common sense solution will be found where financial stability risks will be minimized. But I should also warn about another possibility. If this uh, lack of outcome, of solution, will continue and will approach the, the end date, the private sector itself will have to prepare on the assumption that there will be a hard Brexit. And that's where things may be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it necessarily big financial stability risk, but certainly uneasiness, quite uh, so uneasiness, financial uneasiness in markets and, uh, and intermediaries and, and CCPs and their member banks and so on. Mr. McHugh? I hear anyone else, yes. And it's, did yeah. OMT anticipate populism? Um, would you be able to do no, anything? No, we, we won't speculate on that. I just, if, if, if you ask me what's available, that's what's, that's what's there. Okay, one uh, quick question on Please. the uh, uh, commission proceeding. Would it be counterproductive, possibly, to enforce the rules against Italy? Um, it might, be pro might make the deficit worse if you find them. Um, and with the, the, the view to the uh, European Parliament elections coming up just um, motivates the, uh, the anti-European um, sector of the electorate even more. So um, can the rules be enforced? Would it be counterproductive to enforce them? I, I, think, I think you're asking uh, very good and very serious questions, but I am not the one who should answer these questions. I think you should ask them the commissioners. Mr. Bondermann. Yes, um, thank you. Um, as a follow-up to my colleague's question just now about OMT, um, Italian politicians seem to have an expectation that if the spread rises too much, the ECB will somehow intervene. So that's why I wanted to ask the following. Um, in, in case the ECB in any future crisis surrounding Italy um, would f or any other country would feel the need to intervene by purchasing uh, sovereign debt of individual member states? Would the OMT program really be the only available tool or would there still be a way conceivable to do it um, outside of the OMT program? Thank you. Now we are talking about the specific situation and what is available for the ECB towards a specific country is OMT. And the OMT is, as you remember, is subject to uh, having a program with the ESM and is also subject to the assessment by the Governing Council of the ECB that the undertaking of the OMT is that doesn't prejudge the monetary policy for the whole of the Euro area. But that's what's, that's what's there. Uh, our mandate, as I said before, is a mandate towards price stability, not, uh, not towards uh, financing governments, uh, governments' deficits or 
adhering to a fiscal dominance situation. Mr. Schumer? Good afternoon, Mr. President. As, uh, Andres Stum from Expansion. Uh, you have mentioned the spread between the Greek and the Italian bonds, that the, which is now less than 70 basis points. I don't know if you consider this to be a fair valuation, considering uh, we ha what we have seen and the rating difference between the two bonds. Thank you very much. Look, as I said before, we, we don't, I mean, don't have a crystal ball here to say what's fair, or what's not fair. And, uh, and um, so that, that's also, by the way, that's also one of the reasons why uh, usually central banks don't target specific rates uh, because it's very, very difficult to assess what is a fair or equilibrium rate. And um, so. Mr. Heiting. Luke Heiting, Market News. Um, one of your colleagues recently remarked that assets might be mispriced. Sorry, Bob where are you? Market <laughs> oh, News. There you Sorry, are. hi. Okay. One of your colleagues recently remarked that assets might be mispriced uh, and bubbles may be building up. Uh, and also urged market participants not to become, quote, too lazy to prepare for less convenient times. Do you share those concerns? Um, and secondly, having less discussion on reinvestment until December, what happens if you can't build consensus? Yeah, well, I, how I could I not share <laughs> what this colleague of mine said? I gotta be prepared, of course. <laughs> And uh, whether there are bubbles or not is a different thing. It's a different assessment, and we have to look at specifically the, uh, the um, situation of the Eurozone. There, there are certain segments of financial markets like uh, prime commercial real estate and uh, high yield or leverage corporate that are the where the valuations are actually stretched according to any, any standard. Um, other segments don't look especially stretched, and, uh, and more, most importantly, we don't see that build up of leverage that uh, we'd seen before the crisis. As a matter of fact, the, um, the private financial sector is not over leveraged. And, um, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why um, why, even, even in the face of one-off events that on other occasions would have led us to say uh, that is, there would be trouble in the financial markets, enhanced volatility, interest rates going up, take the case of Brexit, take the case of elections in Europe here and there, people were expecting serious consequences on financial markets, didn't happen. And didn't happen for Two reasons, first of all, because monetary policies remained accommodative throughout, and second, because the private financial system, not being over leveraged, was able to continue giving credit to the economy. And I think this is one, one, important, one important aspect. Now, of course, we, we have to monitor carefully. That's why we should not be as, uh, as mm, I think almost my colleagues always say, we should not be complacent. A final question to Mr. Hewing, please. Uh, Jack Hewing, New York Times. Um, I, I wondered what, what it, Italy has already been downgraded by uh, Moody's uh, to one notch above investment grade. What would happen if sometime in the future all four ratings agencies lowered Italy to below investment grade and that would mean then that Italian banks could not use their government bonds as collateral at the ECB? Have you considered that scenario and what tools would you have to, to help the banks? Um, second question, if I could, is you, just, you said you were very confident about a compromise. No, I didn't, uh, say, I'm sorry, I didn't say very confident. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said so, confident. Okay, my question is, why are you confident? I mean, do you know something we don't about some kind of no. scenario in the works? And would you ever consider playing some kind of mediating role given your knowledge of Italy? Uh, the answer to your last question is absolutely no. No, it's not, it's not our job. Uh, we are, as I, I started all this discussion saying this is a fiscal discussion. And, uh, and it's not the central banker's job to, 
play the mediating role. Uh, there is nothing I know more than what you, what you do know. And, uh, and, and, but I, I think in the end, it's just uh, good, um, good common sense perception what is, uh, of what is uh, the goodness for the country and the interest of the public, of the households, of the people that will lead parties to converge to some sort of agreement. Um, so that is, uh, now the, yeah, the first question is what if? What if, we don't know. I mean, just, but what you said is absolutely correct. Uh, if there were a situation where there would be a, a sequence of downgrades of the four grading agencies and so on, there are rules in place that would actually do what you just said. But I wouldn't speculate more than that about saying what if. Thank you very much. Thank you.